come, ladies and gentlemen. This is what we, we describe this dialogue session as an interactive dialogue on a very, very important topic, you know, the state of democracy in uh, Bhutan. And I'd like to invite the speakers. Now, I'm going to name the speakers in alphabetical order. Okay. So we are going to invite the speakers to this stage. Limbo Dam Chidoji. I'm Lily Wangchuk, Dashu Neten Zam, and Dr. Tandi Doji. I think I need to point out that this was not planned, the gender balance. We happen to have two women and two men. That was not planned. And also the, you know, the di diversity, the representation of uh, Bhutanese society, because we have one Limbo, we have one Am, we have one Dasho, and we have one doctor. Okay, so that's as, so I think perhaps there's hope for Bhutanese democracy. And uh, there'll be another surprise when we, when we ask them to speak. We haven't given an order yet. They're going to draw lots on who's going to, this, for the sequence of their presentations. Now, by way of introduction, by uh, in trying to introduce this uh, dialogue, I'd like to try to uh, provide a kind of context, you know, place this dialogue in the context, in the perspective I think we are a democracy with a vision, with a national vision. And uh, this vision, if we uh, are to find a consensus, I'm sure, would be gross national happiness. And achieving gross national happiness would mean, I think, in ensuring the sovereignty of the state and happiness of the people. Happiness has also been uh, ex uh, explained by His Majesty himself as being a just, harmonious society. Okay. Now, these two are interdependent because you cannot actually have a uh, sovereign state without uh, harmony in society, and you can cannot have harmony and happiness if you don't have sovereignty. So, to try and put democracy and our dialogue, this interactive dialogue, in that context, in that perspective, you know, it's back to GNH, which gives us the perspective that democracy is not the goal, not the ultimate goal, but the path to good governance. I know there's a debate on what democracy is, but I'll not go into the details, but this is what I understand from a GNH uh, perspective. And when we talk about governance, I'd like to explain governance as, as, uh, as the functioning of society, you know, the broad functioning of society, not to be mixed up or confused with government. Because governance means functioning of society, which means besides government, we have uh, civil society, we have media, we have uh, the business community, we have the citizens. So in terms of uh, good governance, that's how I understand it, that's how I'd like to explain it. And when we talk about governance here, the 10 years of governance, 10, 10 years of democratic governance is not a long time. Okay. But at the same time, we also understand that democracy is a process. It's not a goal. You don't reach democracy and stop there. I think it's a process, and we know from the experiences here around in the region and around the world that it's a process that goes on and on. So the idea is that we, today, after 10 years, we t take stock of where we are. You know, what we have done, what we have not done, what we need to do to try and understand where we are. 10 years, where has, where has that uh, brought us. Also, another uh, goal objective is to, uh, you know, to try and raise the uh, national discourse in Bhutan. You know, we're coming into the year of the third general election. So where, where is our national discourse? Now I'm, I'm going to ask the speakers to pick the lots and we will have the, we'll have the presentation. Good afternoon, Lah. I'm the youngest politician here among the speakers, but perhaps the oldest citizen. Should there be a distinction? Should there be a distinction between the politician and the citizen? I'm asking you, should there be a distinction? An engineer, a citizen, a teacher, a citizen? They should not be, isn't it? Why is there this distinction? I think you may like to reflect, all of us, politicians here, many politicians, development partners. So let's look at that. State of democracy, the very fact that we don't have a speaker from the ECB is the state of our democracy. Oh, by the way, I forgot my precious fee. 
vocês. I think I feel safe to safe to talk from my heart. I feel safe. I need to remove my mask. This is a state of democracy. I'm not here to give speeches, by the way. I think we've given many speeches. We've heard speeches. I'm not an academia, so don't expect all these philosophies from me. But I'd like to share my 11 months of political life. And through these experiences and through these many stories that I have, hopefully that will illustrate the state of democracy. This was one. We've always heard that democracy is not about politics, political parties, but it's about values. But I believe that political culture has defined or defined all democracy. We talk about values. Trust, for example. I believe that trust is a foundational value. What is the level of trust among citizens, among neighbors, between citizens and government, between institutions, media fraternity and CSOs and the government? Let's like to reflect. I'm just throwing these issues. Citizens are no more, or we are no more subjects, but we are citizens. But what do we mean when we say I'm a Botanist citizen? What do we mean by citizenship? And I think in democracy, that is perhaps foundational. As a democratic citizen, as a GNS citizen, what does it mean to me? It's not only about my rights, but about my responsibilities. Trust and participation. How do we participate in governance? How do we participate in democratic process? How have we participated in the last 10 years? Is it only voting? Dashu Kinli, our moderator, said it's not only about voting. But I like to believe, I do not know, it appears that the general mass understand because now we travel around. I've traveled about six songkaks. And when you meet people, talk to people, they feel that their right, is, their right comes only after every five years. Every five years, they're very important. But after that, what? After the elections, what? Some people even don't come to our meetings because they're tired. But we begin to, in fact, we need to advocate that democracy is not only about elections. It's not only about that people are important every five years. Every day, people have to be important. Citizens have to be important. Citizens cannot be just passive recipients. There has to be space for citizens' voice. Do we have the space? Do we feel that confidence in expressing your voice? Or are you? I think we need to ask these very important questions. Institutions and people. We have all the institutions, the parliament, the media fraternity, the CSOs, the constitutional bodies. Structures we have. But within the structures, how strong are we? How independent are we? Are we able to fulfill our mandate, very sacred mandate, without fear, full consciousness, and with total professionalism? Let's ask that question to ourselves. The people. When you talk about people, I'd like to focus on women. How many women parliamentarians do we have? In the meetings, women will always sit behind. How do we hear your voice? I have been now meeting many people, many women to come forward and join. It's very difficult. If you spend one hour with a prospective male candidate, you spend five hours with a woman prospective candidate. Why are we what we are? Are we so scared? I don't think so. We are very well educated, exposed, well disposed, but still, so difficult. When we go around, we talk to women, we said, it's not about fighting against men. It's not about doing what men are doing, but it's about women's concerns, women's view, even at home. Nangi up, nangi am. Nangi up has different aspiration, am, different aspiration, concern, and desire. Similarly, where is the women representation? I think women need to come forward. Talking about participation, empowerment, do the citizens feel empowered? Okay, now a lot of powers going down, resources going down, but where has it stopped? Local government? Regional government? Central government? Okay, it goes down. But where is the space for the citizens to participate? Do they know how much budget that they receive? How do they engage the accountability that they should fix? We went around, ORCs cracked, just eight months old, roads in disrepair, schools abandoned, 
And when you ask the citizens, this is your resources, this is your wealth, this is your money. What to do? We don't feel that confidence to raise this voice. Now you may think that I'm just painting a very sorry state, but these are the realities. Of course, many good things have happened in democracy, roads have been built, the services have been reached. But in terms of real, the softer aspects of democracy, I think we need to really deeply think and remove our masks. And people who are in positions of power need to create the space and build that trust and confidence. I think the biggest capital of democracy is trust and confidence. Unless we have the trust and confidence, and trust and confidence comes only when the fear is removed. You talk to people, civil servants, so scared. Local government, when you go down to the field to mobilize people to talk to, so difficult. Sometimes you land up with only six people. Apolitical. What does apolitical mean? We need to engage. And democracy is all about engagement, dialogue, and participation, and confidence in each other, and trust. And how can we have a strong culture of democracy in that environment of fear? Stories now. I'm going to relate so many stories. That's why I think if you have to have a true culture of democracy, freedom of fear, I think all of us have to work towards freeing ourselves from fear. His Majesty said that democracy is for our nation to continue to be secure and sovereign. Democracy has to be strong. And whose responsibility is it for to make democracy strong? It's ours. Let's ask this question, what have you done to make democracy strong? What have I done to make democracy strong? What have we done as political leaders? What have we done to make democracy strong? And from my experience, my little experience, I said I'm the youngest politician here, 11 months old. It's been very divisive. Politics is a very big component of democracy. It's been very divisive. Like Pezang, Ata Pezang, just because he was working for a party, he couldn't get a pair of oxen to plow his field. Everybody's so suspicious. My friend who went to her constituency, she was asking for refuge or stay at somebody else's place. He said, no, you cannot, because if I allow you to stay at my home, people will think that I belong to your party. These are the stories, and it's not an isolated story. These are stories which are pervasive. Whether we like it or not, I'd like to admit that. Divorces, we have heard about divorces happening between husband and wife, father and son. Recently, we were in Tashigang. A home in Uzorong has been separated because they didn't get along because they, somebody, the father said, I want to vote for that party and the other. So what are the parties doing about it? Are we further making our society more divisive? At the Doji Wangdi, he said, this one question has been troubling me. So I said, what is it? So he said, I'm so happy when I get everything free of cost, when I don't have to pay anything, I'm so happy. But there are times when I have sleepless night it's okay with me, but what happens during my children's time? Sometimes it scares me. From where does the money come? I asked Atta Doji Wangdi to ask that question again and again and again and again and again. Whether it is a Zongda who's visiting him, or whether it is a Gap who's visiting him, or whether it is a politician like me who's visiting him. I think I'll, I'll end with this, um, the electoral corruption. I think this is very important. When I joined politics, two, after joining, two days after joining politics, somebody who is in politics now, and of course, two of my friends who are out of politics said, you have to change. And my response was, I did not come to change myself, but I came with my hum humble feeling that if I can do something about it collectively and individually. Money. My people, my friends, even my students have told me, out of concern, Madam, and we have come to the, we have resigned to the fact that nothing can be done without money. Is that the sort of democracy that we want? People are saying that now, that's up to rendo, tiros or rendo. Laptop, tim mitup. Vouchers. Che, na misam lap damta yi me. Che, ke ngalu, wabzo chichu mo chen ngad, che lu chokin tuzu bo ma. Jutin che ammita me. Ta kholo chukin matso. So, what is the perception? What is the understanding of democracy? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I have not brought a mask with me, but as a politician, I'm compelled to wear many masks. Let me begin. 
this panel discussion with a brief background to the uh, topic of this panel discussion, that is the state of Bhutan's uh, democracy. Well, democracy in Bhutan is unique in two ways, that it is a gift from the Golden Throne, and people have not fought for it, that it has become so successful within a very short period of time. Of course, when His Majesty the Fourth King commanded the introduction of uh, democracy in Bhutan, there were a lot of apprehensions among the people. And rightly so, because having lived under 100 years of monarchy under our benevolent kings, people were apprehensive about change, about uh, democracy. But His Majesty the King prevailed. And then the process for the democratization of our country began in earnest. Well, I would like to say that democracy did not evolve overnight. In the words of His Majesty the King, the highest achievement of 100 years of monarchy has been the constant nurturing of democracy. As far back as the 1953, His Majesty the Third King established the National Assembly of Bhutan. In 1959, the Trinjum Chamber was enacted by the Assembly of National Assembly of Bhutan. In 1965, the Red Advisory Council was established. In 1968, the High Court was established. The Council of Ministers was established. And so this was a gradual evolution of democracy and not a democracy that was introduced overnight. As rightly pointed out by the former Chief Justice, who was also the chairman of the Constitution Drafting Committee, democracy in Bhutan is evolutionary and not revolutionary. And then to immortalize the noble visions of His Majesty the Fourth King, the constitution drafting process was started under the chairmanship of the former Chief Justice of Bhutan uh, with his 39-member uh, team. Uh, I was in the background working on the draft constitution. And later, as the Attorney General, I was also the member secretary of the drafting uh, commission. So therefore, I know at first hand what has gone into the making of our constitution. His Majesty has commanded that uh, our constitution contain all the fundamentals of an ideal democracy. Alongside the drafting of the constitution, His Majesty the Fourth King also established constitutional offices which are very important to the success of a new democracy. And uh, therefore, the Election Commission of uh, Bhutan the Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, Commission of Bhutan were established. The Royal Audit Authority and the Royal Civil Service Commission were revamped. And the Office of the Attorney General was also established. So thus began the political transition to democracy in 2008. And it started on a very positive note. And it was reassuring for the people who had a lot of apprehensions when His Majesty the Fourth King said, and I quote, I am confident that a very bright and great future lies ahead for Bhutan with the leadership of a new king and a democratic system of government that is most suited for a country as enshrined under the constitution. I have every confidence that there will be unprecedented progress and prosperity for our nation in the reign of a new king, unquote. Well, uh, well, we assess the state of Bhutan's democracy after a decade or so, it is also very important to assess it against the backdrop of uh, an ideal democracy. Now, there have been a lot of debates and a lot of the proponents who had uh, debated the ideal features of an ideal democracy. But all of them have come to a general consensus that uh, an ideal democracy must be a combination of a lot of things, namely effective citizen participation, equality in voting, inform electorates, inclusion in the decision-making process, fundamental rights, political institutions, free and fair, and frequent elections. It's not just enough to have free and fair elections if the next election is going to happen in 20 years. So that's why the word frequent is also very important. Then, of course, the freedom of expression, the freedom of uh, association, and uh, separation of powers. Well, I don't want to paint a doomsday picture of a democracy because it does not do justice to our shining model of a very young democracy. So let me then begin to give a picture of the state of uh, our democracy by giving you an assessment of the democratic institutions 
and other players outside of the democratic institutions and uh, the people's perception and apprehensions to what has been happening. Having been in the parliament for more, almost a decade, uh, I have seen how the democratic institutions have evolved over time, how the players outside of the democratic institutions have done their part. And therefore, uh, I would like to assess some of these uh, important democratic institutions and their contribution to the strengthening of our democracy. Well, um, in order to go to that, I would also like to quote the aspirations of His Majesty the King when we embarked on this uh, democratization process. His Majesty the King said, and I quote, the king, country, and the people of Bhutan have a common aspiration for democracy. We aspire for a democracy of rule of law, democracy with unity, democracy with integrity, democracy with talent and meritocracy, democracy that is responsible, and democracy that serves. So based on this, I would like to give a fair assessment of the achievements and the failures of the democratic institutions starting from the parliament of Bhutan. Well, His Majesty the King as the head of state has been the unifying force and the symbol of unity. His Majesty has also been the driving force behind the proper establishment and the strengthening of democracy in our country. The parliament has also played a key role in that uh, under the constitution, the mandate of the parliament, both houses of the parliament uh, is making laws, representation of the electorate, scrutiny of state functions, review of laws, policies, and practices, and of course, promoting democracy and good governance. So we have seen that uh, despite being a very young democracy, despite having very limited experience in governance, the first parliament and the second parliament have done a marvelous job. And uh, of course, uh, that has also contributed immensely to the strengthening of the democracy. Well, I don't want to go in elaborate on all these points because I have very limited time. Because of the debates in the parliament that sometimes gets very hot, there were apprehensions that party interests prevail over national interests sometimes, that politics is very divisive and creates disharmony in the society. And therefore, there is a need for us to have a matured approach to politics. Politicians must join hands to a constructive approach and uh, we must also define the role of our MPs, whether as NC or ruling or opposition. The executive during the two successive governments have shouldered responsibilities for implementation of the 10th and the 11th five-year plans and uh, provided good governance. They have also defined the goals of state and determined the resources that were required to implement our plans. So all in all, there was uh, a very successful transition and also a successful implementation of these plans, thereby contributing to the progress of the country. But there was also skepticisms and uh, apprehensions, especially there were perceived nepotism, certain degree of uh, corruption, lack of adequate discourse with the electorate. And so therefore, there is a need for creating transparency, more transparency, involvement of the people in the decision-making process and so on. Similarly, the judiciary, the constitutional bodies, the local governments, all have contributed immensely to this democratization process. And also the political parties have given choices to the people based on values and aspirations of the people, promoted unity and progressive economic development, and ensured national interest prevails over uh, party interests. But again, uh, their apprehension of regionalism, disharmony, and party interests over national interests. The role of civil societies and women cannot be underestimated uh, in a democracy. As Madeleine Albright has rightly pointed out, development without democracy is improbable. The democracy without women is impossible. So therefore, the empowerment of women and women's political participation leadership is very vital to democracy. Well, um, so what are the lessons that we take from our 10 years of uh, democracy? That there will be no big changes overnight, that we have to take small incremental steps towards democracy, that uh, it's crucial to project a hopeful vision, that we have to create spaces for discourse, build the image of the political parties and the politicians, and inclusion of women and youth in the democratic process. So democracy, ladies and gentlemen, is here to stay, and it is thriving, in fact. And to sum up the 
state and success of democracy, it would be most appropriate for me to quote His Majesty the King, and I quote, for our new democratic system, we establish new democratic institutions and enacted new laws. We began with limited experience and were certainly faced with challenges. Along the way, we were able to identify our weaknesses, respond to change, and address problems in a timely manner. As a result of our dedication and commitment, our institutions continue to grow stronger each day, each year. Our democracy must meet the needs of the people in the country, while at the same time, our people must always have confidence in the future of our democracy. If through these endeavors, we create a just and harmonious society, we will truly have a people's democracy. Thank you. Your Excellencies, members of parliament, uh, representatives from the media, teachers and students, uh, I would like to begin by talking about the democracy index. Where does Bhutan rank on the global scale? So on the democratic index, which is developed by the Economic Intelligence uh, Unit, places Bhutan at 99 out of 167 countries. And I think that's fabulous because 10 years ago when we started, we scored only two out of a possible 10 in that index. And today we score 5.08, which means that democracy is proceeding well. But when we talk about the democracy index, and as mentioned by my predecessors, it's not only about the voting and the elections that take place. According to that index, there are five other categories in which countries are categorized, and that is the electoral process and pluralism, the ability to have different viewpoints. The second one is on the functioning of the government. The third is on political participation, on political culture, and lastly, the civil liberties. And what has happened in Bhutan is we talk mostly about political participation. From that point of view, in 2008, when the first elections were held, there were only two political parties. And we, all of us, were either in one or the other. The elections were carried out successfully, high voter turnout. And then come 2013, there were five registered political parties. Four went on to contest the elections. And today, as we sit, we are four political parties. Voter turnout, although it has gone down over the years, nevertheless, political participation has been very good, says Shunila. So if, although, as Tasha mentioned, although there are many definitions of democracy, for me, I think democracy is about the power of the people to vote the representatives from among themselves, who will in turn enact laws that will rule the country for a fixed term. Therefore, if we look at it that way, then definitely we have a very good functioning democracy. However, I think what is important for us to assess is how are we electing our leaders? How are parties being elected? What is the basis of you voting for a particular candidate? And therefore, this leads me to question the manner in which parties are seeking votes from our voters. And I think in many ways, parties in Bhutan are also to blame. Somehow or the other, we have gone with regional democracies. We are influenced more from our neighbors than from the well-functioning democracies. And by that, I mean that today, if you look at the four political parties, can you really segregate us into clear political ideologies? Are there clear distinctions between these four parties? When you vote for a political party, can you expect the policies and plans and programs that they will enact over the next five years. It is entirely based on the promises that parties make during the campaign period. Unfortunately, those promises are often not in the national interest, but on short-term interest, on the interest of political parties in their haste to grab power. And that is where our voters need to be more aware. And therefore, it is also important for us political parties to have strong ideologies on which we stand so that our voters can predict what to expect over the five years or over the duration of which the party exists. And it is important that uh, all political parties establish themselves in certain ideologies. Given, yes, we started only 10 years ago, none of us are experts in, in democracy. Neither of us are actually politicians. I'm a medical doctor by profession a pediatrician, 
But come 2008, with very few people coming into politics, I left my profession to fulfill democracy that was granted to us. And therefore, I know that it is just 10 years. There are problems, but nevertheless, it is thriving. There are problems. If you look at established democracies like America, although they had their independence and their uh, constitution drafted, I think one of the first countries in the world, it wasn't after 40, 50 years that things started becoming better. That also happened only after George Washington left office in 1796. So for us to immediately, within 10 years, to become a well-functioning democracy, I think it's difficult for us all to ask for that. We are striving. I know it is uh, our onus to also establish um, good procedures, to behave in a manner that is enlisted in the various acts, and also as a political party to be responsible to our voters. So therefore, we can expect that there will always be teething problems, but these are not something that cannot be solved. Then to speak a little bit about my own experience, I have been in politics since 2008, and uh, just to highlight some of the experiences that we politicians and parties face. Uh, one is about the parties that are out of parliament. There may be any number of parties, but ultimately there are going to be only two parties in the parliament. And therefore, what is the role of political parties outside the parliament? We have been trying to engage ourselves effectively keeping track of decisions being taken at the national level, trying to put our point of view toward, to the voters through the media. However, one, and some of you may not know this, but it's very important that the recent decision by the High Court in our case against the government, one of the ruling was that parties other than the opposition and the government are not answerable and accountable to the people. Therefore, the court did not take a decision on the case that we had put against the government because they said, you are not accountable, you are not answerable. Only the opposition can do that. So that raises a very important question. Then what is the role of parties outside the parliament? How can we play our role more effectively? Uh, second is on the problems in implementing the process for political parties. Again here, while we have many provisions in various acts, to carry out political activities is very difficult. For an established political party, if we want to carry out any activity, there are a number of rules and regulations, there are a number of approvals to be sought. It's not easy to call a meeting, you have to get permission, that also is only during certain periods. Therefore, some of these are quite rigid, Uh Second is also about making equal opportunities for parties to be able to connect with their voters. For the two parties that are in parliament, the government and the opposition, they can meet people on a daily basis. They can travel around the country, talk about the issues. However, for parties outside the parliament, that is not possible. And therefore, this is something that we have been trying to raise our voice to say that we need an equal level playing field. Coming to a level playing field also, Bhutan is unique because we get campaign funds from the government. However, here again, I think there needs to be careful thinking. I know in the past we have deliberated on the state providing funds for political parties to sustain themselves during the non-election years. And the lack of these finances of course, I'm Nathan alluded to whether money is required. Money is definitely required. You need to have an office. You need to pay your staff. You need to travel. However, the limited sources from which parties can source their funds is very limited. Snowman. And the, how many people in Bhutan can actually contribute towards political parties? How many people actually want to be part of uh, a political party? Uh, actually, there are a number of things to talk about. Uh, but I would like to conclude by saying that yes, there are problems, but democracy will succeed. It will succeed. We need some time.
We can see the difference from 2008 to 2018. People are now more aware. La. You cannot now use influence or bribe because people will ultimately vote for the person they really want to vote. So I can definitely see some good changes that are taking place. And despite all the problems and difficulties that we may have in our infant steps uh, in democracy, I would like to be, uh, I would like to be optimistic. And that is because uh, of what is stated at the very beginning paragraph of the preamble of the Constitution, which is the basis of our democracy. So I'll just quote, we the people of Bhutan, blessed with the triple gem, the protection of our guardian deities, the wisdom of our leaders, the everlasting fortunes of the Pelden Drupa, and the guidance of His Majesty the Druk Gyalpo, Jigme Kesan Namge Wanchu. We can make democracy better, Sishunila. Thank you, Khadij. And good afternoon to everyone. Today I stand here not as the president of DCT, but as a party representative and spokesperson for DPT. A party that I joined two months ago for the very topic that we're discussing here, to better the state of our democracy. My motivation to better the state of our democracy is primarily sparked from a total commitment to safeguard and nurture our unique democracy. Our democracy is unique from his very noble birth, where His Majesty, the fourth king, selflessly forsake absolute monarchy and bestowed democracy upon Bhutan. Uh, forcing democracy upon people by those in power is unheard of in the world history. History only records democracy had to be earned through hardship, through revolution, through bloodshed. Today, we have every reason not only to celebrate, but also expend every resource that we have to nurture our democracy in truest sense and to fulfill His Majesty's vision for Bhutan and the world. However, as a dedicated citizen, I remain concerned that some forces challenge the state of our democracy, shakes the core values of our unity and solidarity, something that uh, our monarchs have so carefully nurtured over the last 100 years. Today, our principle of one nation, one people, is at great risk of being affected with divisive politics, victimization of supporters, differences of a political choice affecting relationships and growing mistrust. It is sad to observe families, friends, neighbors are torn apart by political parties and it's challenges like these people are losing faith in democracy and politicians. I would also like to take this opportunity to highlight some specific challenges and how we can subtly overcome to advance a model democracy. Just as our democracy is unique, our politicians are also unique and well-meaning. We need to stop projecting our politicians and politics as negative. Because if we do that, we cannot attract the best and retain the best. Becoming a politician is not easy. We must acknowledge that with respect, civility, and empathy. We must collectively welcome, encourage, and support such politicians and not demonize them. We also need laws in place that are more supportive for the best of the civil servants to come forward and embrace politics. There is no state or democracy without citizens. Democracy is what citizenry votes. So each one of us here must take equal responsibility to ensure that we not only go and vote, but by engaging in forums like this, holding our elected uh, officials accountable, and by making our contributions and making our communities better, and above all, upholding our unity and solidarity. It is critical we get out to vote and elect the best leaders, otherwise the opposite might happen. In particular, I would like to urge our women and youth out there to not only come and vote, but be part of the change you want to see. Be the voice of the voiceless of women and youth whose voices are left behind. 
A free media is an indicator of a healthy democracy, but however, it can also hijack election to disadvantage the better option. The danger is significant in situations where voters lack the skills to discriminate damaging false messages from good ones. Social media is a devil in disguise that is now being effectively used to carry out fake messages and negative campaigns putting the future of millions and nature at stake. For instance, social media is being used by political parties under fake identities to tarnish the images of aspiring politicians and parties. This is inciting fear, anger, resentment, further dividing our society. There is urgent need to address this fake negative coverage on social media, and I humbly call upon authorities such as ECB, BIGMA, BMF to consider strategic inventions to highlight the importance of civic education and the need to launch awareness campaigns to educate our voters to filter messages that they receive. It is also important for us to protect institutions and ensure independence of important institutions like political parties, constitutional bodies, media, judiciary, institutional, uh, educational institutes, and the civil service. The integrity of these institutions is an indicator of the health of our democracy. In particular, I would like to highlight the need to respect and protect political parties. The health and integrity of political party is a measure of success of democracy. However, over a decade I've observed growing division along party lines and the division is even wider at the grassroots level. Political campaigns are marred with negative campaigning, mudslinging, rumors, political corruption, bribery, instead of leading people to make enlightened choices to elect top politicians to form outstanding governments. I call upon leaders and candidates of all political parties, let us put an end to this unhealthy political trend. To pursue political parties' interests, one can even go to an extent of branding an entire party like DPT, for instance, as an anti-national party. If 40% of the population are supporting DPT, are we saying 40% of the Bhutanese are anti-nationals? And Molops against whom? Some 50% of the candidates in DPT now are all mostly new candidates, and most of us have joined there with a positive motivation. During my last few uh, weeks of interaction with them, we've only brainstormed about how better we can serve our country. I've not heard any discussions otherwise. And I've not found their loyalty and devotion towards our king any different from any Bhutanese here. Monarchy is our most sacred institution, and no Bhutanese can ever forget we are where we are today as a nation because of the selfless contributions of our kings. Our king is above all of us, and every Bhutanese here, including members of DBT, loves our king. How can anyone even question another person's loyalty and devotion to us, our king? No party or individual should claim monopoly of loyalty and dedication to the throne and question another party's or individual's loyalty to the throne and dedication to the Tawasum. We are all here for the right reasons, to serve our king, people, and country. In the name of democracy, we have greatly divided the people. Please let us now not divide our people from our king. As a small country, this is a very dangerous trend. The very word Molop should not even be allowed to be used, let alone accuse. By using such a word and accusing one another, what kind of division, fear, and discrimination are we creating amongst our citizens? What kind of messages are we conveying to our children? And what kind of impression are we sending out to the world that we are divided? Such harmful messages when shared on social media is accessible to the entire world, portraying a wrong and dangerous impression, leaving us vulnerable for others to meddle in the internal affairs of the country. The issue is not about DPT. The issue is a national concern. In the words of His Majesty the King, democracy is a timeless process in our collective endeavor to build a peaceful and prosperous nation. Let us ask ourselves, are we moving in the right direction? 
There, His Majesty also stated there are two dimensions to threat that can undermine the security of the nation, external and internal conditions and factors. No matter how grave the external threats may be, nothing can harm us if we are united like members of a close bonded society, family. This is an important remind for, reminder for all of us Bhutanese to stay united. Past is past. We must learn to forgive, forget, and move on in a spirit of understanding and solidarity, focusing on what unites us is patriotism, not what divides us. Our political leaders must be willing to sustain something greater than their own survival by not compromising our national security, but considering the following. The institution of monarchy is our most sacred institute, which is held in high esteem and reverence by every Bhutanese. The party should not resort to the use of the sacred institution, the throne, to pursue the political agenda. Throne is a sacrosanct institution, and no party should exploit the institution for their interests. No party should also use the throne or royal prerogative, such as Lankidu census, as part of the pledges. India-Bhutan relationship is something that every party considers as a cornerstone of a foreign policy. No party should distort facts and use foreign relations, particularly into Bhutan and into China. We should not bring out national security issues and pledges to the armed forces. We should not use religion and religious bodies. We should not use, and rather we should allow the free media and promote regular inter-party meetings. For the sake of proposing demo unique democracy, I challenge our existing political parties and their leaders to sign a pledge here today, committing we stay away from divisive politics. Let us compete 2018 elections on our ideas and competence of our candidates and stay away from dirty politics so that the best can win, so that the people of Bhutan can win. Any misuse and abuse of this commitment could be resolved through inter-party mechanism by a multi-party committee within BDD in the presence of media. We have done ourselves enough harm in the name of politics and democracy. Can we now not reflect and agree to survive in peace and harmony, united and strong, as one nation, one people? There are no ngolobs in this country, for all of us love our king and our country. We are neither DPT, nor PTP, nor DNT, nor BTP, but Bhutanese first. Can we not share this message across the country that we all want? I know it's hard to achieve this, but it's harder not to try. If you are a true politician, I humbly call upon all politicians, media, voters, let us set our differences aside and work on setting Bhutan on a journey towards the best democracy in the world, because Bhutan and our kings who made the sacrifices deserve no less. I end my st statement here with the question, if democracy is all about dividing our people, putting our own national security at risk, do we really want democracy? Are we in line with the vision of His Majesty the King? If the answer is otherwise, and if all political party and politicians truly believe you are there for the right reason, I think we should have no hesitation signing this pledge of commitment today. Thank you. I think it's a reminder that we all need to get involved in this discourse to take, the, to take our country forward. The constitution and the whole process of democracy itself gives us the mandate, you know, the mandate to, to place national interest before personal interest, to, to it place a mandate on political parties to ensure a united society, not a divided one, and uh, also good governance, security, sovereignty, check and balance, good governance. I think it's better that we leave this place with hundreds of questions more to be asked, and uh, you know, with the with the eagerness, with the enthusiasm to continue this discourse, you know, to tackle, to start discussing this very very complex issue. Okay. So thank you very much.